Counting to God, Part 6. We've been di discussing the book, Counting to God, A Personal Journey Through Science to Belief by Douglas L., published in 2014. It's available for free on the web. And uh, it has a cover, although I suspect most of the readers won't see that cover unless they stop to look at it. Um, we're uh, dealing with part two, the science of belief, and right now we're in chapter 10, the origin of life. This will be the first of two parts on this chapter, since there's too much material really to cover in one, uh, one hour or less session. And he asked the question, how did life begin? And he gives the answer of Richard Dawkins. Nobody knows how it got started. That, of course, is not in one of Richard Dawkins' books. It was an interview that he did on tape. Um, and then he quotes Genesis 1.20, and God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. Now, of course, one could have chosen the, the uh, comment that uh, God said, let the earth bring forth grass uh, as well because that's actually the first life. We uh, humans tend to be animal-centric and therefore ignore plants. Uh, but uh, there's all of this. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Genesis 1 uh, account where he creates the animals and then man himself. Um, Douglas L. starts out, Richard Dawkins may be the most vocal atheist of our day. I credit him in his admission above for honesty. Science alone has no explanation for the origin of life. To me, the discovery of the complexity of life and our inability to conceive an, of an even a plausible pathway for its origin is the third wonder of modern science, the third of seven in our count to God. Life is a miracle. In the creation of life, the most primitive, simplest form of life, we see the hand of a master designer. At one point in my journey into the science of belief, I decided I needed to learn the basics of molecular biology. I ordered the standard college treatise, 1,462 oversight pages of single space text, and started reading. Fun, fun, and more fun. Okay, it was not what most people would consider fun, but to me, it was riveting. So you have an idea of the kind of guy Douglas L. is. It was all there, all the details about how life runs because of biological parts we call proteins, how life builds proteins using DNA, and how you need a lot of different proteins, perhaps 100,000 or more different types for a human being, and a lot of complicated machines built by putting those proteins together just right to have life. Uh, it's worth commenting that the picture, if anything, has gotten more complicated since he did those, that reading. Um, and uh, it's fascinating that uh, we only have about 20,000 proteins coded for, um, and the rest of them are either a, a mix and match, which is one of the advantages of having an exon system, um, or else uh, modify in another way. So it's, you're looking at a very complicated procedure. Um, proteins are special molecules. At one point, the math nerd in me could not help but calculate, literally on the back of an envelope of, on an airplane, the fantastic improbability that a single functional protein was ever created by accident in the entire history of the universe. Next week, we'll go over some of those calculations. I was thunderstruck. It was an aha moment. I remember staring at the calculations in disbelief. Couldn't others do the math and see what seemed obvious? It was a no-brainer. At that moment, I knew modern science supported belief in God. I want you to notice that particular passage because it is probably the most powerful argument there is for a God who intervenes in nature. Not just a God who set up the thing and let it run, but a God who actually somehow, whether starting from a special design so that things would come together, 
uh, in a very special way or reaching down and manipulating things. It's not clear how you would be able to detect the difference between those two. But certainly, plan of an unbelievably exquisite kind. The fantastic improbability of the origin of life is shocking. The calculations are relatively simple, yet compelling. I'll show you how to do some of them in this and the next chapter. One might perhaps choose to believe that other evidence for the existence of God, such as the fine-tuning of the universe, can be explained by laws of physics we don't yet understand. That's part of what inflation is all about, trying desperately to figure out how you can do this with laws of physics without having to involve God. But we know well the laws of physics and chemistry that govern the creation of molecules, and we can estimate the probability that certain specific and complex combinations were formed by accident. And those calculations, which are unbelievably uh, optimistic, still leave you no room. This chapter and the next two chapters reveal the technology of life. This chapter focuses on the origin question. How did life begin? It is the Achilles heel of neo-Darwinian belief. It is the question that won't go away, the question scientism can't answer. Now, I will have to say it's not the Achilles heel of neo-Darwinian belief because neo, uh, uh, Darwinian, Darwin started with uh, life and most people will say the origin of life is beyond evolution. And you know what, they're right. But that means, of course, that evolution cannot be used to explain the origin of life as he will point out. We'll set the stage with ground rules. Then we'll follow my journey. We'll look at the Miller-Urey experiment, how in high school it hastened my path to atheism, and why it is no longer considered good science. We'll look at Harvard's failed origin of life initiative. We'll look at the evidence I find fascinating, if circumstantial, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence program and the search for life elsewhere in the universe and we'll begin to calculate the fantastic improbability of life. That is, that's what we'll do next week. The ground rules. As we enter the debate, we need to remember two rules. First, you have to apply the chemical and physical laws we know today. You can't say life arose because of some unknown law of chemistry or physics or because the laws of chemistry and physics were wholly different billions of years ago. Scientists agree that the chemical and physical laws we observe today have not changed in any significant way since the creation of the universe. This is known in part from studies of natural low-intensity nuclear reactions that have taken place in our Earth for billions of years and from light emitted billions of years ago by distant quasars. In fact, it is commonly believed that the natural laws we observe today also governed the very early universe less than one trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. Of course, at the Big Bang, there are no laws. The second rule is you can't use Darwin's theory of natural selection to explain the origin of life. Natural selection, sometimes called, slightly inaccurately, survival of the fittest, is the concept that traits which give an organism an increased ability to reproduce are more likely to be passed on to succeeding generations. To have natural selection, you must first have a means of inheriting traits across generations. Before life existed, there was only inorganic matter with its chemical and physical properties. There was no way to preserve and reproduce successful traits in succeeding generations. Darwinian theory at most explains life's ability to adapt. It cannot explain the origin of life. Inorganic material does not naturally select. There is and was no most likely to succeed form of inorganic matter. This seems obvious, but many otherwise reputable scientists refuse to accept it. They argue that the molecules most likely to eventually become life developed by natural selection, hogwash. Inorganic molecules form and change according to the known laws of chemistry and physics. Inorganic molecules do not compete with each other for food. They do not pass their genes on to other inorganic molecules. They do not have a means for passing on successful traits. And that's the thing. Here, natural selection totally fails, even in theory. All you have is random combinations, not even mutations in this setting. 
For example, one author talks of inorganic catalysts evolving so that those who are best at promoting their own production and inhibiting their own destruction relative to other variants became more numerous. They too promoted the construction of variants themselves and so evolution continued. This sounds plausible until you realize there is zero science behind it. It is just the author's naked belief that someday molecules will be found that violate the second law of thermodynamics and become ever more complex instead of degrading. Life requires fantastically complex molecules and inorganic molecules do not become ever more complex over time. Complex molecules break down and degrade. The largest, most complex molecules ever found in meteorites or in outer space are trivial compared to the molecules found in all life on Earth. The largest hydrocarbon molecule found in space is anthracene with 14 carbon atoms and 10 hydrogen atoms. And the largest molecule of any kind is 70 fullerene with 70 carbon atoms and nothing else, which of course doesn't work with life. The machine parts of life, proteins, typically contain thousands of atoms of multiple elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, etc., some sulfur, precisely arranged. Such molecules have never been found in outer space. Moving along there, the Miller-Urey experiment. I was taught in high school that scientists had shown life could have arisen on the ancient Earth without a designer. The basic concept was lightning struck some ancient pond billions of years ago and life was created by accident. Totally by accident, no design, no purpose. We all know accidents happen, you fall and stub your toe, lightning interrupts the television show you were watching, lightning hits some primeval ooze and creates life, a simple accident. What was not accidental was the effect this scientific knowledge had on me. It hastened my shift from God to atheism. I believe this scientific misinformation has had a similar effect on millions struggling with their personal version of the great debate. The experiment I was taught is called the Miller-Urey experiment. Stanley Miller was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. In 1953, he and his faculty advisor, Harold Urey, attempted to reproduce conditions on the surface of Earth billions of years ago. They mixed together chemicals in the proportions they believed were present in early Earth. Um, interestingly, their belief partly was based on the fact that it must have been this way, otherwise life could not ar uh, arrive. Uh, to this mixture, they added electrical charges and they found that certain amino acids were produced. As we will see, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins and proteins are the machine parts of life. This was reported as the first time an organic molecule had been produced from inorganic lab chemicals and it caused quite a stir. Now, I will say this for L, he's probably right that there were people who portrayed it as such. In fact, urea was made um, probably close to 100 years earlier. Um, and uh, so it shouldn't have caused that much of a stir, but um, I think what caused the stir was that it was the first time amino acids had been produced from inorganic lab chemicals without deliberate uh, synthesis. And that's probably fair. The neo-Darwinian thought police, aided by the popular media, immediately seized upon this experiment as proof of their theories. And it's true, it's portrayed in most textbooks as being... Uh, uh, one of the key experiments. The barrier between non-living matter and life had been broken, they claimed. Without a great deal of critical analysis, this production of amino acids was hailed as a sort of missing link validating Darwin's theories. It was and remains a serious blow in the minds of many against the side of belief. Misplace, misplaced belief in the Miller-Urey experiment continues. A 2011 study of 22 high school textbooks found that 19 discussed the Miller-Urey experiment as a possible or explanation for the origin of life. I've met many people who think life began simply because lightning struck some primeval pond billions of years ago. The Disney movie Fantasia contains such a scene set to the music of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. By the way, for those who say, oh, but it took a long time, somebody failed to uh, 
and let Walt Disney know about that. Um, despite this popular perception, the Miller-Urey experiment is no longer considered good science. We have known for decades that all of life on Earth requires, among many other things, 20 different amino acids. These are special groups of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms. There are about 500 different types of amino acids. Every living creature uses exactly the same 20 amino acids to build proteins. And of interest, uh, the Miller-Urey experiment was uh, produced other amino acids besides the ones that are needed for life. So that means that it's not just a one chance in 20. You also have to sort through all of the other ones that might not be quite so conducive to life. Number two, a mechanism for linking amino acids together into long chains to build the molecules we call proteins. There is one, and it's baking things. It's very difficult to do, but... Um, then special hard to produce chemical groups called nucleotides, which also include phosphate atoms to store the code of life. And that, so far, has been completely resistant to the lightning scenario. And finally, four, the information to assemble all these groups of atoms into the right three-dimensional shape and the right order so that they simultaneously become both the code for life and the machinery to process the code for life, uh, code of life, and do the work of life. The Miller-Urey experiment fell far short of demonstrating how any of these could have occurred by accident or mere chance. The hypothesis that life forms by pure chance in some primeval pond is contrary to modern science. For starters, wrong atmosphere. Consensus views of Earth's early atmosphere have changed. First, Miller assumed no oxygen and ample free hydrogen. Both of these assumptions are now questioned. More recent analysis suggests some free oxygen was present in the atmosphere of the early Earth, and very little hydrogen, by the way. Although oxygen is essential for life today, it is thought life could not have formed in the presence of free oxygen because oxygen reacts quickly with many organic compounds and would have destabilized early molecules. Second, actually this is not number two yet, Miller also included chemicals rich in hydrogen, such as methane and ammonia. There is little or no current evidence that such chemicals ex existed in substantial quantities on the surface of the primeval Earth. It is thought that you have more of nitrogen and carbon dioxide. According to Science Magazine in 1995, the early atmosphere looked nothing like the Miller-Urey simulation. And that's probably a fair statement if you read the literature. Two, no primordial soup. While all agree the early Earth was a hot, chemically active place, it is not clear how the building blocks of life, if they were accidentally created, would not have rapidly degraded or been destroyed by ultraviolet radiation and other factors. In addition, some of the chemicals produced by the Miller-Urey experiment were not conducive to life, such as hydrogen cyanide. I was shocked personally when I found that out, the major ingredient of, or major product of all of these reactions was cyan hydrogen cyanide, except for one, where it was the second major ingredient. You don't hear about that, um, which is extremely poisonous. And formaldehyde, which is highly toxic. You know what they do with formaldehyde, they take, take it and put it on uh, dead bodies so that medical students can study them um, without worrying about the body's growing mold or whatever. Kills everything. The primary organic product of the Miller-Urey experiment was tar. The primordial soup theory, quote, doesn't hold water and is, quote, past its expiration date, end quote. Number three, no way to link amino acids. Amino acids do not automatically link together. Amino acids are like plastic blocks that snap together. It takes energy. To quote the National Academy of Sciences, two amino acids do not spontaneously join in water. Rather, the opposite reaction is thermodynamically favored. So when you have equivalent, uh, equilibrium, you're going to have very, very little 
put together, most of it will be completely pulled apart. Number four, no information. Where did the information to build life come from? We will focus on this below or in this class next week. No serious solution to any of these problems has been proposed. Not just one, but all of them are a problem. One mathematician has stated that understanding the origin of life cannot be bridged within the current conception of biology. That's a frank admission that not only are we empty-handed now, but we are likely to be empty-handed for all of the foreseeable future. Even Fred Hoyle, the once atheist, who originally mocked the theory of creation of the universe and sarcastically called it the Big Bang, agrees. In short, there is not a shred of objective evidence to support the hypothesis that life began in an organic soup here on Earth. This is a guy who thought that there was an intelligence out there and it was creating stuff. Eventually, he was forced to that position and he thought that influenza might be being sent by that intelligence. So he's not, he's not exactly friendly to the god that he ran into, or at least thought, thought that he ran into. Um, and so uh, this is not somebody who is a happy theist, even yet. The concept of the Miller-Urey experiment, that life could have formed somehow from purely natural and random events, may far outlive belief in the validity of the experiment itself. That's probably because it came before the experiment. Even if Miller and Urey got it all wrong, the concept that inorganic chemicals accidentally combined to form the first living organism has for many a powerful appeal and has had for a long time. Because we don't know all the ways chemicals and compounds might have been concentrated on the early Earth, it is reasonable, at least in my view, to cut the Miller-Urey experiment a little slack. For purposes of argument, let's consider the possibility that amino acids could have been created by accident or random events, and perhaps in great numbers. But again, there's no scientific basis for concluding that all of the amino acids required for life could have been produced by accident or linked together by accident. That's certainly true. The mere existence of amino acids does not create life. Quoting, a mixture of simple chemicals, even one enriched in a few amino acids, no more resembles a bacterium than a small pile of real and nonsense words, each written on an individual piece of paper, resembles the complete works of Shakespeare. To create life, you need amino acids plus a lot of information. Information on how to assemble the amino, <coughs> amino acids or other complex molecules to form life. How could hundreds of thousands of amino acids have arranged themselves with other necessary complex molecules, including some that are extremely unlikely to arise by accident, to create life? And how likely is it that these very complex molecules, many of which work together with amazing precision to read a chemical code and manufacture themselves in other molecules, accidentally formed at the same time and in the same place as the precise chemical code that they are able to read, and that contains the precise instructions to build these e the exact molecules and other necessary proteins. Both Miller and Urey later admitted the mere existence of amino acids does not yield life. Harold Urey came to this conclusion in 1962. All of those who study the origin of life find that the more we look into it, the more we feel it is too complex to have evolved anywhere. That's a pretty blanket statement. Now remember, this is the URI of the Miller-URI experiment. We all believe as an article of faith that life evolved from dead matter on this planet. I wonder, do they burn heretics? Is, it is just that its complexity is so great it is hard for us to imagine that it did. So, how do you like that for faith? Go ahead. Well, if it evolved from dead matter, if it's dead, it, life existed before? Well, I, I think that he's being imprecise there. He would have, if you pinned him down, he would say non-living matter. Um, 
But, you know, that's faith in the teeth of the evidence. That's what I thought that the religious people were doing. But, I mean, that's as close to an admission of we believe in spite of the evidence that I've seen. So did Stanley Miller in a paper he co-authored in 2007. The origin of life remains one of humankind's last great unanswered questions, as well as one of the most experimentally challenging research areas. Remember, he got his PhD doing this experiment. Despite recent progress in the field, they've been working on it, but in spite of that research, a single definitive description of the events leading up to the origin of life some 3.5 billion years ago remains elusive. And now, by the way, the consensus is closer to 3.8. The Earth had barely cooled off, supposedly, when this happened. It happened fast. Maybe that lightning strike wasn't a bad metaphor. Oh, Harvard's Origin of Life Initiative, and some of you may or may not have heard of this. It was, there was a big splash at one time, and then it kind of faded, and you'll see why. Of course, not everyone in the predominantly atheist scientific elite has admitted defeat. Because admission of defeat means God stepped in. Or, well, something that's worthy of being called God stepped in, at least. Um, since 2006, Harvard University has sponsored an Origins of Life initiative. And by the way, when they set it up, they said in five years, we want to get this thing done. Keep that in mind. Five years. That's right. Throw enough money at a problem and you'll solve it. Promise you. <clears throat> Harvard would surely disagree, but to me and to many scientists, it looks like they're dead in the water. As of mid-2012, notice that's six years, not five years, before the initiative took down its list of research papers, they folded. Think about that. That's an admission to, of defeat if I've ever seen one. They just took down the list of research papers. Its website had included no new biology papers in three years. So it means they got three years of work out of it and then they ran into a wall. In March 2009, the Origin of Life initiative brought together a number of distinguished scientists to discuss how life could have begun. Here's how it went, quote, it may be difficult to believe, but there was a common theme to this seeming cacophony of scientific expertise and discovery. The theme was, we just don't know. No one knows how life began. Where did I hear that before? Richard Dawkins, right? Underneath it all, it was refreshing to hear a bunch of really smart folks say, we don't know. It was humbling and put things in a Grandiose perspective. I'm not sure quite what that last phrase meant, but um, what's amazing is not that we don't know precisely how life began. What's amazing is that our most brilliant and motivated scientists drooling over the possibility of eternal fame and a Nobel Prize for solving just a piece of the riddle can't come up with a mildly plausible scenario. They really are dead in the water. If you don't believe me, here's a 2011 state, uh, status report from Eugene Kuhn. Notice that's five years after the beginning of the big push. A senior investigator at the National Center uh, for Biotechnology Information, National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, and who recognized experts in the field of evolutionary and computational biology. We'll be hearing from Kuhn again uh, We've already heard from him once, but we'll hear from him again in, in a week. Despite many interesting results to its credit, when judged by the straightforward criterion of reaching or even approaching the ultimate goal, the origin of life field is a failure. 
we still do not have even a plausible, coherent model, let alone a validated scenario for the emergence of life on Earth. Certainly this is not due to a lack of experimental and theoretical effort, but to the extraordinarily intrinsic difficulty and complexity of the problem. A suggest succession of exceedingly unlikely set steps is essential for the origin of life, from the synthesis and accumulation of nucleotides to the origin of translation. Notice that the entire stretch. Though through the multiplication of probabilities, these make the final outcome seem almost like a miracle. Hmm. So it seems like a miracle, and it looks like a miracle. Perhaps it was a miracle. Perhaps it was an act of God. The Harvard scientists published suggestions a few years ago that certain fatty acids could have served as membranes for the first living cells. They cannot explain how complex proteins and the required DNA or other coding to build these same proteins could have simultaneously formed inside any membrane. Perhaps frustrated by this inability to penetrate the molecular biology obstacles to the origin of life, the Harvard Origin of Life initiative has changed course towards the search for Earth-like planets. The initiative redesigned its website to fo focus on astronomy and away from the intractable problems of the origin of life. Notice they got all their money to research the origin of life. Before we begin to estimate the fantastic odds that life was created by accident, even assuming all the right chemicals were present, let us, like Harvard, turn to a related, although ultimately, ultimately inconclusive question. The universe is a big place. If life arose by accident on Earth, and if there are billions of Earth-like planets out there, surely it arose by accident in other places. So where is it? Extraterrestrial life. If we step back from the chemistry for a moment and turn to astronomy and the search for life elsewhere in the universe, we find other evidence that perhaps the creation of life was special, perhaps an act of God. Let's start with our cosmic neighbor, Mars. For many years, Mars was thought to be the most likely place for life elsewhere in the solar system. Mars is somewhat similar in size and composition to Earth and the next planet out from the sun. As early as 1887, some astronomers thought they saw lines on Mars that were canals created by an intelligent civilization. The astronomer Percival Lowell drew sketches of intricate canal systems. Although many astronomers were skeptical and suggested, correctly as we now know, that canals were an optical illusion, the idea captured public attention. On August 27, 1911, the New York Times Sunday Magazine ran the following headline. Martians build two immense canals in two years. Vast engineering works accomplished in an incredibly short time by our planetary neighbors. This was published just over 100 years ago, and after Einstein developed his theory of special relativity, you can't always believe what you read in the paper. I gotta say, not only you can't always believe what you read in the paper, you can't always believe what you read in the textbooks. When I was taking biochemistry, Leninger was peddling the, uh, uh, which is otherwise a very good textbook, by the way, was peddling the origin of life thing. So we've almost got it down. We've almost got it down. We've got this and we've got this and pretty soon we'll figure out the rest of it. And then of course their predictions did the same thing that the Harvard initiative did. Mars had been the inspiration for delightful and sometimes terrifying stories of alien life. One of the most famous is the 1938 radio broadcast of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, which I'll Spare you the details, but if you're interested, he has a nice little paragraph on it. As a child, I remember wondering if canals on Mars were real. The ideas of canals on Mars did not die until 1965 when NASA's Mariner 4 took detailed pictures that showed no evidence of canals or life, only rocky desolation. Actually, it turns out there is one canal. It was probably produced by a massive flood on Mars, and everybody pretty much agrees with that now. Um, it's not technically a canal, it's more like a canyon, but 
whatever. Only rocky desolation. Yet microscopic life may be present on Mars, and that exciting possibility has contributed to the launch of Mars rovers. These are robots controlled from Earth with the ability to move about on the surface of Mars, take pictures, and perform sophisticated tests on Martian soil. Some of these tests are designed to detect life. August 5, 2012, witnessed the landing of Mars on Mars of NASA's newest and most sophisticated Mars rover, Curiosity. Curiosity is also looking for signs of life. It has discovered what scientists believe was an ancient stream where running water once existed and made an amazing discovery. Conditions on Mars were once suited to life. We have found a habitable environment that is so benign and supportive of life that probably if this water had been around and you'd been on the planet, you would have been able to drink it, says one NASA scientist. By the way, don't try that now. Um, first of all, it'd be hard to get to Mars, but secondly, if you did get there and you tried to drink the water, it would be full of per perchlorate, which would not be good for you. What you don't read in the paper is the obvious conclusion to be drawn if Mars has no life, that the absence of life on Mars, despite, despite once favorable conditions, suggests the creation of life on Earth was special. But other evidence suggests there is life on Mars. Some believe NASA detected life on Mars in 1976. Here's how physicist Rob Sheldon explained the findings to me. It was called the re labeled release experiment. I am assuming that this is from an email that he got just because of the way it's typed up. It was developed over the past 50 years as a way to test water downstream from a sewage treatment plant to see if it was clean enough. It consisted of putting some sugar and test water in a flask, incubating and looking for bubbles as the sugar was turned into carbon dioxide by the bacteria. Jill Levin suggested replacing the sugar with radioactive carbon-14 labeled sugar. I'm not sure what that too is doing there, but it's there, so I left it in. Uh, then as the bubbles came off, a Geiger counter sampling the air above the sample would begin to chatter. This was not only quantitative, but very sensitive because the CO2 rate kept increasing as the bacteria grow, giving a very specific biologically produced growth curve, basically exponential. In 24 hours, it could sense two to three bacteria per milliliter of water. In terms of mass, that is about one part in 10 to the 11th. By way of comparison, the mass spectrometer that Viking Lander used in 1976 had a part per million of, or, pardon me, a part per million or one part in 10 to the sixth. And that's why I think this is probably emails because that's classically the way to do it, email. Or maybe in the best case, per part per billion or one part in 10 to the ninth. So, Gill's experiment was selected for both Viking landers and performed perfectly. Two samples were tested at two different sites, and a control was baked at about 150 C, I assume that's just 150 degrees centigrade, for several hours, basically cooking any life to death. A total of eight runs were made. The four test cases all showed the growth curves observed on Earth, the four controls were all flatliners. And there was a sample that he let sit in the hopper drying out for three months, and when it was tested, it also flatlined. You can read all of his papers on his website or go to the NASA Viking Lander website and read up on labeled release experiment. I find this exciting. To me, life on Mars would in no way diminish the wonder of the origin of life. It is possible, some might say likely, that microscopic life has traveled between planets. Some speculate that life could have traveled within the solar system inside meteorites, or rocks, that are blasted off the surface of one planet and ultimately captured by another. And before you say this is a totally uh, evolutionary scenario, don't forget that in most people's models, there was a, uh, at least a major impact uh, a meteorite impact in the 
uh, during the middle of, or during the late part of the flood. Probably another one in the middle of the flood that created Chesapeake Bay, but I'm thinking specifically of the uh, uh, Chalexicab, uh, the one that hit off the coast of the Yucatan uh, Peninsula. And so uh, that was enough to blast rocks with bacteria on them into space, and they could have landed on Mars after a while. So to say that if we find life on Mars, well, obviously uh, the Bible is incorrect, would not necessarily be true. There are meteorites on Earth that scientists believe came from Mars, and it seems possible that Mars and other planets in the solar system have captured meteorites from Earth, such as pieces of Earth blasted into space 65 million years ago, well, depending on whose scale, maybe 4,000 uh, years ago, um, in the meteorite impact that may have ex ended the reign of the dinosaurs. We have learned that some types of microorganisms can survive in extremely harsh, harsh environments. If life is ever found elsewhere in our solar system, a key question will be whether it has the same DNA protein design, see chapter 11, as life on Earth, and thus perhaps once traveled between, the, between planets. Life on Mars would be a blow to our terrestrial chauvinism, the forces of scientism would, be, would surely claim it demonstrates that life is not special and it could have arisen without a designer. But that is a belief without support in true science. There is no remotely plausible theory under any conditions for the origin of life by pure chance. The idea of advanced life beyond the Earth, but within the solar system, now seems fanciful. Its other planets and bodies are even poorer candidates. Some have suggested that life may exist on the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, per particularly Europa, the smallest of the four moons of Jupiter, discovered by Galileo, which appears to have an icy crust with the possibility of warm liquid water below. Perhaps, but all of those moons suffer from huge variations in heat and cold that could destroy or damage life. The search for life outside our solar system has been a total failure. Uh, moving on, our galaxy is 12 billion years old. Some estimate that a civilization as advanced as ours or more advanced would colonize the entire galaxy in 5 to 50 million years. Even if they did not want to leave home, they could use self-replicating space probes. Such von Neumann probes would allow an advanced civilization to explore the entire galaxy without leaving home, perhaps le in less than a million years. We have found no aliens, we have found no probes, we have found no signals. So where are they? One or five or even 50 million years is a blip compared to the 12 billion year age of our galaxy. So you can't say, well, but there hasn't been enough time unless we're the best and the first, which should put us in an interesting position. We have found absolutely no evidence that intelligent life exists anywhere else in the universe. Of course, this evidence is inconclusive. It does not prove that life or even intelligent life does not exist out there. Perhaps it's quarantining us. As a matter of fact, that would be a religious perspective. Which, uh, the first broadcast out into space were speeches of Adolf Hitler, for what it's worth. Or you could go with the theory of my comic strip heroes, Calvin and Hobbes. The surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that it has never tried to contact us. <laughs> Let's go back to biology and take a closer look at what we call life. The wonder of life. It is hard, perhaps very hard, to appreciate how miraculous life is. We are life. We are surrounded by life. There's life within us in the form of bacteria and viruses. There's life in the air and life in the sea. We have found life in rocks. We found life in rocks miles deep. Life around hot volcanic vents miles below sea level, and life in the Arctic. To residents of planet Earth, life is everywhere. It is all around us. Yet when you stop to ponder exactly what life is and how it works, you begin to realize how precious life is. From the perspective of engineering alone, life is an amazing chemical machine. It is a chemical machine that possesses the ability to reproduce, to make copies of itself, to make other machines of the same type. This is astounding. As advanced as our science and technology are, 
We human beings are not even close to building a different kind of chemical machine that can reproduce without assistance. Uh, we can copy what we've got a little bit, but in terms of making a whole new machine, we're not close. Sure, we can tweak existing forms of life to enhance crop yields or obtain other benefits, but that is just a relatively slight modification to an existing form of life, an existing chemical machine. We do not have the ability to create from scratch a new design for a chemical machine that can reproduce. We are not even close to having that ability. We take life for granted because it is everywhere. Our planet is overrun by biological machines. There are at least 10 million different types or species of machines. Some estimates that tens of millions of other types have not yet been discovered. Some estimate. Estimate. The, a giant sequoia is about 10 to the 27 times the size of a virus. That's like comparing Earth to toy marble one half inch in diameter. All of these machines, from the smallest to the largest, are incredibly complex. There are so, so many incredible systems. Coordinated systems allow blue whales to dive thousands of feet below sea level without being crushed and sing complex songs that travel across oceans. Other systems allow bees to do a dance that tells other bees where to find the best source of pollen. There are systems for hiding, systems for fighting, systems for reproducing, systems for getting food, systems for communicating, and so on. And perhaps the most amazing system in all existence, the human brain. I compare life to a chemical machine, but all life, even primitive life, is so much more. To say that life is a collection of chemical machines is like saying the works of Shakespeare are a collection of words, or that my favorite piece of music, Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 2, is a collection of musical notes. Where did all this life come from? How did it come to be? Does life arise automatically from matter as was once believed? The theory of spontaneous generation of life predates Aristotle and it was believed by many into the 1800s before being disproven by scientists such as Louis Pasteur and John Tyndall. Today there are only two choices for the origin of life. Did life first arise by chance, an accidental consequence of random chemical events? Or strange as it may sound, could life have been designed and created by intelligence? Accident or design? That is again the question. And that's the question we'll leave this chapter with. We'll come back to it next week. I think that Doug L. has set out the problem well. I think he also set out the psychology well. I think that's an important point. His trip away from Christianity started with the Miller-Urey experiment. His trip back towards Christianity took on its major strength with the realization that life realistically could not have arisen by chance. So it's important what the evidence shows. And the evidence is clearly in favor of design and therefore by implication some kind of designer. In this, his experience, at least the last half of it, matches mine, realizing that the evidence of life against the spontaneous or origin of life was overwhelming, made me believe that science could say something useful about religion, as it sometimes <coughs> could point to religious truth. It also made me realize that one could not rely on the textbooks but needed to look at the original research and maybe even do a little. Here's where one realizes most acutely the difference between the definition of science as a study of the reproducible, experiment, hypothesis, more experiment, theory, you know, the, the stuff that they always tell you science really is all about, and science as either the explanation of nature without God, me applied methodological naturalism, or the current scientific consensus, which is that applied methodological naturalism is the way to go. Both, or all three if you prefer, definitions are rational and could be and have been used, but they are not the same. And in that realization one drives a wedge between 
science as it should be ter carried out and science as it sometimes is in, in our day all too often in these areas is. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, comment here. Oh, here. Go ahead. Mike's coming. No, I'm just wondering what the people nowadays then would, how, how do they, I don't even know if it's discussed, but how do they imagine that Newton and, and these other guys who were religious people, how they could have even come up with the scientific concepts given that they think that uh, religious thinking limits scientific thinking? Well, um, they view them as partially emancipated. Um, and that it was progressive light. So they... Uh, that's, that, that's the best... Uh, so they were anomalies. Uh, well, so. let me put it this way. Part of it is, when they're pushed, that's what they say. Part of it is, many of them don't even realize that Newton was a devout Christian, not just a Christian. He wrote more on religion than he did on science. Yeah. And if you're wondering, you know, the chronology of ancient kingdoms amended, and uh, the, he did uh, something on revelation, you know, prophecies, uh, which was really outstanding. And people, a lot of people, that fact has not been mentioned, and they are stunned when they find that out. And then they do a lot of scrambling to try to say, oh, but that was back in the, you know, mm -hmm. just coming from the Dark Ages, and he had to believe that, which is baloney because he didn't believe in the Trinity, and you had to believe that. To who else would, I'm trying, trying to think of who else, early scientists that. Uh, oh. Well, Kepler, for one. Who? Kepler, Pas for one. Oh, okay. Galileo re re remained a devout believer. Boyle. And Boyle. Oh. Uh, Galileo. You can, yeah, you can name a whole bunch of them. It's not clear what Einstein really thought, or did he evolve in his thinking? Well, or, I mean, Einstein, or, you know, chain mutate. Well, no. Einstein was a kind of a Spinoza-type god. Sort of believed in a higher power type of yeah. influence, but maybe not a personal god. Yeah, the higher power was vaguely identified, sometimes with the universe, sometimes beyond the universe. But didn't uh, by that time the concept that uh, God didn't get his hands dirty, that he did all of his work with making sure that the universe is mathematical had taken pretty strong root and I think that Einstein was in that camp but it is interesting that there are that there was a point where he realized that there needed to be a beginning and that pushed him into the uh, uh, a little closer into the God range I think there's one point that 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 needs to be uh, pointed out at this point, and that is that uh, uh, when uh, whether, I, whether Newton is a believer or not is not really totally, uh, doesn't really prove anything, and whether Einstein was a believer or not doesn't really prove anything either. But what it does is suggest that uh, the incompatibility that many uh, scientists now feel between science and religion maybe is not necessarily innate. It's more imported from the beliefs of the uh, of the uh, scientists in question. Well, the, the problem too is when you get one polarity, then the other side reacts to that extreme view, and then then of course then now we react to. The other extreme view. So that's the problem: is it gets so polarized, you can hardly have a conversation, rather than uh, you know an integration, in, an integrative sort of conversation. Well, this is what Douglas Hill is trying to do: is do an integration. And um, 
as a matter of fact, uh, there are a few people in the audience here who have tried to do the same thing, myself being one and Leonard Brand being another and Ariel Roth being a third, um, although I have the chronology Warren. reversed. <laughs> Include Warren, too. <laughs> Include Warren, too. Yes, Ariel. Uh, this discussion here is interesting. It's good. Uh, excellent, in fact, I might say. I uh, just wanted to add one comment that uh, uh, Anthony Flew made. Now, you may recall Anthony Flew is an atheist. Yes. And he was marvel. He marveled at DNA and so on. And science kind of converted him back to believing in God. Uh, and apparently. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Doug has done the same thing here. It's a science that converted him back. Uh, and, and the origin of life, interestingly enough, was a key point for both of them. That's the thing. If you realize what the origin of life means, I don't see you have any real good choice. Mm, you yes. pretty much are forced to uh, assume a designer because there's no other good explanation. Mm. But the As they, as they admit... These people, even the people who don't believe, will tell you it's an article of faith. Mm -hmm. There's a few of them out there that try to bamboozle you with, oh, science is getting so close and stuff. Um, but when you examine the evidence, it's not there. But the, the caveat I want to add is, uh, speaking of flu, uh, which is seldom considered, and I, and I understand why, and I suspect uh, that Doug will get into this later, maybe, or... Certainly his uh, calculations will include uh, this, is the question of reproduction. And uh, Flew said uh, one of the things that Dawkins and Darwin have overlooked is the capability of reproduction. Now, it's one thing to have a cell here that has all the components. Uh, it's a whole more complicated game to have a cell that can reproduce itself over and over again. I mean, it's not just working. You have to make yourself over. Yeah. And, and th this aspect of life, uh, I think, is uh, often overlooked. And Anthony Flew, of course, uh, accused Darwin and uh, Dawkins of overlooking it. Um. I don't think they really overlook it. I think they just don't want to talk about it because it doesn't fit their paradigm. And what's really happening is you are having people who are supposed to be scientists, that is, play it straight down the middle, follow the evidence wherever it leads, who are acting like lawyers, who are advocating for their client. And in fact, some people have said, well, scientists really always do that, so, you know, the uh, best way to work is to have scientists individually act like lawyers, and the system will correct out any, in, any uh, deficiencies. That would be true if there was not a, an intense effort to pull the rug out from under one's opponents. If it were totally objective and, you know, you make your arguments and I'll make my arguments, but when you try to shut down the courts that are listening to the other people, that's when science goes from, you know, a, uh, a scientific av uh, attitude to a l benign legal attitude to a malignant legal attitude. Yeah, there and then back. Uh, it's interesting. Dr. Veit collected in South Africa the world's largest collection of Darwinian literature on evolution. And the complexity of the cell reproduction is what converted him from evolution to uh, being a believer in God. Yeah, we, we can make uh, uh, complex machines ourselves. What we can't make is machines that make more of themselves. As, as he noted. There's one thing about these, these calculations that I find uh, interesting, and I won't be here next week, so I'll just make a comment now. Um, 
We can calculate the improbability, you know, it's been done by many people many, many times. Uh, and that, that's, in a, in a way, there's no point in going further because it just is impossible. But, there, but really, those calculations are only the beginning, only the first step. And to illustrate this, uh, an example I like, uh, if, you, if you try to simulate this with talking about monkeys randomly typing on typewriters, yeah. Typing out Shakespeare's plays. And, and we'll discuss that. Okay. Uh -huh. um, the, 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 the calculations, are, like I say, are only the first step. If, you're, if your calculation is going to be meaningful, you also have to calculate the probability of the monkeys filing the type pages correctly uh, whenever something comes out and, and putting new paper in the typewriter and doing all of this before all of it is destroyed by the wind or eaten by cockroaches. I mean, that, that simulates the, the hazards of these chemicals actually coming together. Not only that, but you have to create the typewriter and the monkey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's, it's, you're right. These are hopelessly optimistic calculations. I mean, these are people who say that well, this was once this soup of RNA precursors. Does anybody have any, any idea how difficult that is to get all by itself? Um, if you haven't watched it, it, it go on YouTube and, and watch a, um, a presentation by, by um, Tour, James Tour. It's called the, the Origin of Life and Inside Story. Actually amazing. <laughs> Interesting. T O U R, T -O -U -R. just like the uh, James Tour, uh, just like the tour guide. And uh, for those of you who don't know, James Tour is the probably foremost chemist involved with creating molecular, literal molecular machines. That is, he has created little tiny dragsters out of carbon atoms. I mean, the, whose wheels are like benzene rings, that kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable some of the stuff he's done. He knows how to make nano machines, and he knows how difficult it is to make nano machines, and he knows that lightning strikes are not going to make nano machines. Period. Just a minute, I had one <clears throat> bit of further evidence. He discussed about the early life or the <clears throat> what we call the primordial soup. Uh, he didn't refer to it very much, but one of the facts that uh, has supported creation is the fact that that primordial soup would involve, you know, the calculations usually involve all the oceans of the earth. I mean, you've got to have all the soup you can for such improbabilities. Right. And it doesn't work at all <laughs> in spite of all that soup. But uh, when you look in the geological record, uh, you can't find any evidence of any rich organic material in the ancient seas, uh, or Precambrian layers, we'd state, yeah. that are supposed to be the ancient seas. Yeah. Uh, the geological evidence is just totally missing for this organic soup. Yeah, no, it's it's true, and um, it's also uh, we do have we do have carbonaceous material, but that's not the same thing as you know amino acids, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but if it was the whole ocean water, uh, it wouldn't be just uh, a little pond or a little carbonaceous material, you should have rich uh, organic molecules there, yeah. some kind of goo or something, uh -huh. representing this, this uh, soup that right. uh, might have had all these amino acids to try and get a few of them together to produce uh, a simple protein, uh, let alone all yeah. the proteins we need. Well, it, it, again, it's sort, of, it's sort of like the missing link kind of thing. It's not a link that's missing. It's the entire chain that's missing. Uh, when people say they don't have a plausible scenario, they mean it. 
They really don't. They have an incentive to, to um, uh, look at it with uh, rose-colored glasses. Dawkins did not say what he did because he wanted to believe that origin of life experiments were a failure. He said it because he really knew that that was the truth. Yes. What percentage of active scientists today truly believe in down on their heart in, of evolution? That depends on which scientists you poll. And the reason I say that is because uh, there's a poll that showed that 75% uh, of evolutionary biologists are hardcore atheists and approximately 3% are believers in God. Uh, on the other hand, if you do a poll of scientists in general, uh, at least one of the ones that was done, uh, asked not just about God, but a God who answers prayer. So we're talking, you know, major, uh, and, they, and they said specifically, and, and, that, and that answer to prayer is not psychological. So we're talking about uh, an intervening God, unquestionably intervening God. About 40% of scientists believed in God. About 45% did not. And about 15% weren't sure. And what that means is that the terror that atheists feel sometimes is justified because if there was a 5% switch, that 45% believed in God and 40% didn't, then science would be governed by an uncomfortable minority. And if 10% were to switch, they would be, uh, a, I should say, a plurality. Uh, uh, less than plurality. And if 10% were to switch, it would be an absolute minority. And it wouldn't take much. All it would take is for a lot of these kinds of textbook pieces of evidence to be obliterated because they weren't really true, such as teaching the Miller-Urey experiment really in context that nobody believes it anymore and that we don't have an answer for the origin of life. If that became okay to believe, then the atheist control on science would disappear. And they're scared spitless because if they don't have control over the agenda, they lose and they know it. Is, is, there, a trend, is there a trend to, um, which, where's the trend going? I don't know that we have a couple of um, surveys to be able to say whether there's been a trend or not uh, in order to answer that question scientifically as opposed to, well, I think um, I would have to have some data. Uh, so, you know, you can look at it optimistically like, uh, well, atheism is on the way out, or you can say, well, atheism will hang on tenaciously for dear life for a while, or you can say that atheism is actually increasing. One argument can be that atheism has spread a little bit into the general population because the percentage of atheists in the general population, or at least people who believe that God didn't in, uh, intervene in the creation of humanity, can be shown to have gone up from about uh, somewhere between 6 and 9 percent to about 15 percent in the latest survey. But that's not saying what's happened in science itself. And it may be that the precise reverse trend is happening there. So I don't really know. Yes. Um, yeah, I just, I just should add the, uh, the Pew Research uh, poll, uh, I don't know, about three or four years ago, 
permits one to say state that more scientists believe in God than don't. But that's you need to keep that in mind. It's uh, I think about thirty four percent scientists said they believed in God, and another sixteen uh, percent believed in uh, some kind of deity while uh, only 49% didn't believe in any kind of God. So uh, you can state, you know, the majority of scientists do believe in God. You can't talk about him in science, in yeah. the scientific literature. Uh, but I think, uh, I think that uh, in general, this is a little bit of softening, seems to me. I and mean, this is just purely subjective observation on my part that uh, people are beginning aware, hey, the, this question, uh, life is just too complex. And uh, there's a trend away from hardcore argumentation in favor of uh, no God. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as that develops, I think uh, progressive creation is going to be the model that may be popular. Yeah, I think so too, because uh, then you don't have to challenge uh, radiometric dating, you don't have to challenge uh, standard interpretations of geology, and you can you can have your God as well. And that's where the geological records becomes extremely important and interesting, and yeah. uh, paraconformities and widespread layers uh, yeah. are hard to explain if you don't believe in the flood. Yeah. This question of what's the, which way is the trend going? I don't have any statistics I can talk about. Um, and it's complicated, and Ariel's giving one aspect of this. I, I, from the things, the emotion I hear and read being expressed by different people, I think there's, among a lot of, the, a lot of people, there's a certain hardening of opinions. And perhaps it's what's happening is there are those who are reconsidering God, like Ariel is saying, Perhaps uh, I mean, quite a bit of the influence is ID. Our, our author being one of them. Yeah, uh, ID is having an influence, but those who who won't buy it are hardening their views and becoming, you know, very determined. Yeah, well, I I think they they feel themselves being threatened, and um, uh, one of the things that people will do sometimes when they feel threatened is to lash out, and so I think that's what we're seeing is that. Um, Nobody really cares if you want to be a um, uh, oh believer in astrology. It's not threatening. Uh, and in fact, if they if they think you're a creationist, but you know it's just one of those beliefs you have, then you're okay. And if you want to teach microscope uh, microscopy, fine. But if you take your microscope and look at a triceratops horn and find tissue in it and say, look, there's evidence for my creationism, now you're getting a step on toes. Even if you don't say it so directly. <laughs> Even if you don't say it so directly, as long as they know that you mean it and you know what? The evidence is, is actually pretty good. And it almost speaks for itself. That, oh, look at what I see. Well, how could that happen? Well, maybe it's not that old. Well, you might be right. And, uh, you know, because what's happening now is you're actually a threat to them because, you know, it's, it's a little bit like uh, being a Christian in a Muslim land. Uh, you know, as long as you're not making converts, you're okay. But if you start making converts, them's fighting words. <laughs> Come in down here. I'll give you my own experience. And this is just ad hoc. It, it's, there's no survey to document what I went through. I was at Michigan State University studying geology and this is in the 1970s, finished up in 1981. 
So what you would expect as geology is perhaps the most secular department on campus. Sort of like evolutionary right. biology. Yeah. You would expect that, but I can I was in my mind just going through uh, the names of many of my professors. The majority believed in God. The atheists and there were some, the atheists were very, very quiet. They've become a lot more vocal in your face type of approach. But as far as geology goes, it was the believers that were not afraid to say in front of a whole class, you know, God did this or I believe in God and so on. When I studied um, geology at a field camp through Texas Tech University summer of 1976, the head of the field camp was a very staunch believer a Baptist Sunday school teacher, and he drew me aside. He must have known that I had some reservations about evolution, so he tried to convert me into theistic evolution. See, uh, so you had evangelicals that were um, not afraid to speak up, and now, uh, you know, the church and state issue forbids you to do it in a classroom setting. So that's kind of an ad hoc poll that I'm taking right now. That um, It was a, really a warm, friendly environment when I came along. <laughs> Someone else may have a different opinion. I think in biology it's probably a little, little stickier than it is in, uh, in geology because in geology, if you don't rock the long age boat, they don't really care. They're looking for oil. Whereas uh, in biology, you, you, if you challenge the idea that all of life could have been the result of random variations in natural selection on one or a small group of precursors, uh, then, uh, then you've effectively undermined a pillar of atheism. And one way of understanding it is that from a certain perspective, the job of science is to make the universe safe for atheism. They don't care whether it actually points to atheism as long as it's safe for atheism. Uh, yeah, I just reminisced a bit on my structural geology professor. And, you know, it's hard if you're just teaching the structure of the earth and how, you know, you have orogenies and you have strata dipping this way and you have to figure the dip and you reorient it to what the original bedding plane was and a lot of math and so on, graphs and charts. It would be hard to share a Christian faith in that setting, even back then. But at least once a week he would bring in a little comment that pointed toward Christianity. Now, we had a bunch of, uh, of Muslim students from the Middle East. This was a uh, time of the oil boom, and they were sending thousands of Muslim students from Saudi Arabia and all these big oil countries. Many of them were training at Michigan State. Presumably to go back home and find oil in Saudi Arabia. Exactly, and enrich their pockets, right? But uh, they, they had no problem with that. And then in my department, paleobotany, we had at least three Mormon students, and they were devout Mormons. They took me to some of their services a couple times and, and so on. So like I say, it was kind of a warm, friendly uh, womb for me to <laughs> start my career in geology. <laughs> which really wasn't a career, it's just a hobby. <laughs> uh, just a brief sequel to that. Uh, two Seventh-day Adventists who believed in creation were excused from the department I was in at University of Michigan before I went there, and I did not know that. Frank Marsh wrote to me and said, how did you land up in that den of lions? 
but I uh, thank God I got through there. Uh, the details, uh, at least I was told, uh, the, big, the big test is your comprehensive, oral comprehensive, uh, who are you? And uh, I was told uh, the discussion came up afterwards, well, what about this? Are we going to allow a creationist here? Uh, and so on. And um, there was one professor who wanted to get rid of me. Uh, the outside department professor said what he believes is his own business. The chairman, who was my research guide, uh, said, yeah, that's right. Uh, and uh, an embryologist said, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, a botanist just was quiet, and uh, conversation was dropped. They allowed me to pass. And so can, your committee had one person on who would prefer that you didn't pass. Yes, that's right. And uh, you kept the same committee for defense at the end. And uh, when uh, I went to uh, call for the final defense uh, in the summertime, I finished up in the summertime, the secretary told me, uh, right, that was the one who did not want me to pass. He said, He's on leave this summer, and I just about shouted, praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> and they got a substitute, and um, they stuck to my dissertation, which was uh, not controversial. Well, next week we'll talk about um, the, uh, the math. So those of you who are... Our math nerds are encouraged to attend, those of you who are not. Um, uh, what should I say, uh, caveat emptor or something like that?